speaks about the fact that everything that you're functioning under, basically what they've been giving you to function under, is a lie. That Lucifer is the Lord of the earth because Lucifer essentially is the Lord of matter. Lucifer is God as matter. That's all it is. It is the source of all evil because Lucifer is the light that activates matter into its potential. That's all Lucifer is. How we deal with that reality becomes the truth. And we've been fucking over that reality because the reality has been spoon fed to you in the form of these lies that these ministers of lies have been given to you from these churches and synagogues of Satan. Check? Yeah. Now Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, understand that we are not talking about a person or a personalized God. Let us remember that the context of your reality is based upon how you've been made to perceive deity. Now Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3 simply means the motion of the atom, intense as it is, is actually slow motion compared to the pre-atomic planes. What you see of the atom and what they use all these microscopes and, and atomic scopes to look at and this thing that's spinning so fast that you can make atomic bombs out of, that's nothing. That's like running in slow motion compared to where that particular life force that gave birth to that atom came from. Eventually, this high rate of pre-atomic motion becomes arrested or attenuated on the seventh plane. So when you get this high rate of motion from these atomic energies, it now rests because it becomes very slowed down on the seventh plane, the seventh plane. On the involutionary process of the sixth plane, when man, which is the ideation for the matter, for the, for the, for the uh, spiritualization of matter. See, man is the idea for how matter will be spiritualized. So that was where God had to stop everything for the moment, check himself and see, well, where, where am I going from here? So now within that point where God began to contemplate and meditate on the seventh plane, that's when everything had to slow down and chill for a moment. That's where peace happens. That's where you begin to find the meditative peace and chaos. So in the pre-atomic pre planes, whereas the first five planes and six planes, you could never even realize the frequency levels and the vibrational levels. Only until the seventh plane of existence do we see matter begin to come into form. And those particular pre-atomic speeds begin to slow down so that we can actually see tangible reality come into being. This is the rest or the arrest. See, God didn't rest. God was arrested in the seventh plane of existence. So he arrested the high intensity pre-physical motion. It does not mean that the creator ended his work on the seventh day or state. It simply means that the end of its work was the creation of the physical plane. The morning of the first day is the early sun period, the beginning of evolution, condensation, radiation, and devolution. That was what was done on the seventh plane. It is here that the absolute or the life principle becomes inactive or asleep to itself. Remember that all of the great patriarchs, all of the great uh, 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 principles of the Bible, Noah, Samson, all of them seem to have fallen asleep. Adam. Do you understand what that means, brothers and sisters? All of them represented an aspect of God going to sleep in the form of matter. Every time, no when Noah fell asleep, you understand? He got drunk. Every time you notice, like Joshua, all of them, they were all favored of God, and all of a sudden they did something to fuck up. 
That's because that was God in its pre-material sense when it became part of matter, like when Samson dealt with Delilah. Delilah was nothing more than the physical planes. Samson essentially is the same as Adam, the same as Jesus, the same as every one of them. And they all fell asleep to who they were. The active principle falls asleep in matter and the physical feminine principle gives life to that active principle. She holds the seeds of continuance. Not really the seeds, but the material for the seeds of continuance. Without the seeds of continuance, her potential is not activated. Without that particular potential to be activated, the seed cannot know itself. The word weak in Hebrew is seven. Now, they tell you there are seven days in the week. There's another word, way to spell weak. How do you spell weak? Okay, now W-E-A-K and W-E-E-K. Same pronunciation. Why? Because it took seven days to weaken the Creator until it fell asleep until it became attenuated enough so that life can be on the different levels of matter. On, to awaken matter, the Creator took a week. I don't know if you get it. The weakening of the Creator, or that which took a week, created the Creator. The Creator always from the beginning stages, every time a baby is born within the womb of a mother, that baby, that weak, is the child. That is the creator. The scenario is playing itself constantly over and over again. The word for weak in Hebrew is seven. This, however, is a cosmic week. Seven planetary days. The seven-day creation scenario was not originated by the Hebrews. It was in the Hindu manuscripts 5,000 years ago. The Hebrews didn't make the seventh day sacred either. Before the priests wrote their account and were written in the fourth century, Hesiod in the eighth century said the seventh day is sacred. Plato also said the gods, pitying the laborious nature of men, ordained for them to rest from their labors a succession of religious holidays which took seven days. The first of these every seven days while the seventh day of every month was dedicated to Apollo the sun, hence our Sunday. Even the word Shabbat does not come from the Jews. It is borrowed from the Babylonians, Sabtu or Sabatu, and it is the day of rest, which was observed by them long before the Hebrews. In other words, the Hebrews got all their metaphysical ideas from all of the older races. Now, you know, the Jews keep talking about their captivity. If you look at the years they claim they were in captivity, they will figure out 700 years in captivity. That's pitiful. But it's not about the Jews being in captivity. The Jews essentially were the genetic principles. They took that particular scenario and created a race out of it so that they could do the shit that they're doing. The chosen people are nothing more than the elemental principles that bring about the life forms on planets. That's what the Jews mean. The creation of the world was and is a metaphysical process. And Western man, remember, I told you, Western man is incapable of metaphysical thinking. That's how come uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Church, you know, has no concept of metaphysics. And if it does, it didn't impart it to us. Sons are the creatures or the creators of worlds. Sons are the creators of worlds, not gods. And because the ancients knew this, it became the basis of sun worship. So sons were the creators of worlds. Eden was a paradise. Now if you understand paradise, it means para means by, and dice means stars, of the stars. So Eden was of the stars. So when they talk about Eden being of the stars, it means that it was a cosmological principle. Where, what, when, why, and how was the Garden of Eden created? The Bible said the Garden was planted eastward in Eden. So, the Garden of Eden and Eden were not one. Check it. Eden is therefore something vastly different and bigger than the Garden. 
It said here, the Garden of Eden was planted eastward in Eden. Eden is the planetary entity. Remember I told you there is a programmed energy of thought processes, of higher mind processes that go into creating planets. This planetary entity in its pre-physical state, that is prior to the material state, the mythological source of all evil, Eastward, there is, forward, that is, was planted in the garden. In cosmology, there is no other garden except a life-bearing, life-sustaining planet, the Earth. A planet is a small plan. A plan, E-T-T-E, -E, or planet. It's a small plan in the process of evolving, in the process of bringing the cosmic ideation into existence. Now they say the Hebrew word Eden comes from the old Babylonian name for Mesopotamia. God Nidan, or Gan Edan, or Gan Hedan. That is, the garden of the east in the middle. Now the word Mesopotamia means middle land. As does the Norse word Midgrad, home of the gods, the midland, in between involution and evolution. Throughout mythology, the middle land is that middle ground between involution and evolution, that is the earth. The so-called happy lands that were lost were always in the west, as the west represents the setting of the primordial sun, the Hesperides, the Ecclesian Seas, the Fortunate Isles, the Isles of the Blessed, Valhalla, all the rest of these, all whose passing represents what is known as the twilight of the gods. Prior to this myth, because of matter, the source of all evil, and their foods were nectars of the gods. Remember they said that all the foods that were eaten at that time were ambrosia? Well, these were the higher elemental energies, the etheric, the astral, mental elements. That's the ambrosia. This was the paradise mythological man lost. Mythological man lost... The, uh, the ability to walk in the higher planes of higher frequencies and resonance. But you see, the plan is, it has to be lost for there to be a redemption. There is no such thing as original sin. Let's look at original sin. This is the bullshit that Christianity has been given to you about original sin. Man didn't create the original sin. The original sin was actually God's. God created matter. Matter is the source of all evil. So if matter is the source of all evil, and we're participating in matter, we didn't create matter, God created matter. So God created the evil. So the original sin was God's, not man's. But the guilt trip was given to you. Now we're moving on to the point where we left off. Verse 5 in chapter 2. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb before it was in the field, for the Lord and God and I, to, we told you about that. This is the true meaning of the first account of creation. That is, archetypal and pre-physical. The ancient writers obviously presented it as such in his original account, but the latter-day priesthood took theirs and walked it. Would the original people have written there was not a man to till the ground if he had written the first account? Obviously not, since in that one man was already created. Remember, there was no man to till the ground. But he knew nothing of the present of the first chapter. Remember, this thing was put together and edited by Shakespeare and his boys, the last one. So they didn't know what they were putting together. And they didn't even have the sequence right. In the original version, there was no physical man as yet, nor was there even a physical earth. Reference to this begins only in verse 8. And the Lord planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Verses 6 and 7 are either out of place, or is a true reference to pre-existing man. You see? Here it is. But there in the midst from the earth, and watered a hole in the face of the ground. The Lord formed man of the dust in the ground and breathed into his nostrils and breathed into life and man became a living soul. 
And then he said, and man planted in the east of Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. Wait a minute. How is this that he's born of the dust and the ground? And over here he was born of something completely different. In the image of God. See, they don't know what they're putting together. Whoever it is that's piecemealing this ain't had a clue of what it is they were writing about. They got two separate creations. The word man should not be capitalized as man. Check it out. Now, Now you notice the word man should be capitalized as man. It should be capitalized. Physical man was not yet made for the physical earth. The references to nostrils and breath are purely figurative. The living soul is not the human psyche. It is life. This particular account of man created from the dust is also stolen from the Babylonian, the Gilgamesh. In yet another Babylonian myth, a woman named Aruru creates him in this way. And this is from the Babylonian text. Aruru washed her hands. Clay she pinched off and spat upon it. Iabani, a head she created. Uh, Iabani, a hero she created. An exalted offspring with the might of Nina or Nina. So verse 8, God actually planted man in a spinning hell in space. A violent primordial earth. Each planet in its own has its own creator. Since there's no physical tree of life or good and evil, this verse is solely symbolic. And I'm going about verse 9. I'm going forward now. I want to go forward because I, this is what we did already. And I, I promised everybody else that I would be adding more information for you. Now, before we go forward, we will deal with the psychopolitics and how they play with your head. And this is what Christianity has been doing. It says, it is all important to know that the entire subject of loyalty is thus as easily handled as it is. One of the first and foremost missions of the psychopolitician is to make an attack upon Christianity and, the ins and make attack upon Christianity and insanity as synonymous. Just as the government as well. It should become the definition of insanity, of the paranoid variety, that a paranoid believes that he is being attacked by the government or by Christianity or by communists. Thus, at once, the support of the individual so attacking this falls away and the masses follow you. Okay? So when you see some people telling me and they're leading me away with handcuffs and they say some violent or some... What do they say here? Uh, in the, here's what they say in the Amsterdam News. Controversial pastor speaks at health forum. You can't catch something unless you already have it, said Reverend Valentine at the Harlem State Forum last Saturday. Valentine was one of several speakers at the forum, expressing opinions on the variety of health issues facing black Americans, including hypertension, strokes, heart attacks, asthma, AIDS, and the infant mortality. Another disease you might be carrying with you is right now, Valentine says, is your social security card. This document and several others, marriage license, driver's license, birth certificate, et al., are in Valentine's judgment, not law. I told them where they could find the information, but this is my judgment. <laughs> Detrimental to a citizen's well-being. A birth certificate, he claimed, is a child mortgage on your body. It tells everything about you, when you were born, where you were born, how much you weigh, and who your parents were. All of this is vital information which they use to subject you. You said it was all right for them to have it, and that's why they kick your door down. And now that you are becoming more aware of the police state you live in, you can be sure that the repression will increase. Now, if you was to take that, you didn't know me from Adam or Eve. You'd think I was crazy. And that's exactly what they want you to do because they follow the psychopolitics that the Russians had put down, pretty much what the Americans had taught them how to put together. And it says here, the general propaganda which would best serve psychopolitics would be continued insistence that certain authoritative levels of healing deemed this or that the correct treatment for insanity. 
these treatments must always include a certain amount of brutality. Propaganda should continue and stress the rising incidence of, a of insanity in our society. The entire field of human behavior for the benefit of the country can at length be broadened into abnormal behavior. So in other words, everything that you do can be characterized under abnormal behavior. They now have a first alert button for children who are abused. Now the children can carry a button around their necks so that they can summon the authorities if they feel they're being abused. <laughs> Thus everyone indulging in any eccentricity, particularly the eccentricity of combating psychopolitics. Wait a minute now. The eccentricity of combating psychopolitics could be silenced by the authoritative opinion on the part of a psychopolitical operative that he was acting in an abnormal fashion. This, with some good fortune, could bring the person into the hands of the psychopolitical operative so as to forevermore disable him or to swathe his loyalties by pain drug hypnotism. On the subject of obedience itself, the most optimal obedience is unthinking obedience. The command given must be obeyed without any rationalization on the part of the subject. The, common, the command must therefore be implanted below the thinking process of the subject to be influenced. Let me repeat that. The command must therefore be implanted below the thinking process of the subject to be influenced and must react upon him in such a way as to bring no mental alertness on his part. Every goddamn Sunday you go to church and you call upon the name of Jesus to save your ass. But every time you walk out to church, you meet the same bullshit that you run in there to find solace and solutions to. The psychopolitical and the psychopolitician are at work in every factor of your society. There are three main churches, the Church of Medicine, the Church of Politics, and the Church of the Church. And each one of them uses the psychopolitical programming to get to your brain. You are subjectively worshiping something and someone who never existed except in your mind. Now, if I tell you that you worshiping Jesus, you might as well go worship Satan. No, don't go to church. No, don't go to hospitals. There are psychopoliticians and psychopolitical operatives who will stand with the force of the society's working psychopoliticians behind them to make me crazy in your eyes and to make sure that the subjective programming of Jesus Christ stays in your head that you focus all of your creative force into it, him giving him life Christ don't give you life you give life to Christ and the reason why they need you saying his name, constantly thinking about him, constantly praying, is because your thoughts give life. You are the creator. So you create the Jesus Christ. You give life to Christ. So you give life to your own goddamn misery. Now I know everybody who wants religion, who needs their panacea, who needs their band-aid, who needs their balm, Who needs that solace that the church gives them? Who needs to think that something or someone will say, I know that God exists. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. You have a song that you sing. You teach it to your children. You know it. Everybody. Jesus loves me. This I know. Cause the Bible tells me so. What's wrong with y'all? 
One more word. <laughs> it is in the interest of the psychopolitics, of psychopolitics, that a population be told that an hypnotized person will not do anything against his actual will. Listen carefully, people. It is in the interest of psychopolitics that a, pol that a population be told that an hypnotized person will not do anything against his actual will, will not commit immoral acts, will not act so as to endanger himself. While this may be true of light, polyhypnotism, and general welfare therapy, it certainly is not true of commands implanted by the use of electric shock, drugs, and heavy punishment, wherein the entire structure of thought processes are altered permanently. Electric shock. How are you getting your electric shock every day? You turn on your television. That goes right into your subconscious. You keep getting programmed every day by, by subtextual, subliminal electric shocks. Drugs. There are every type of drug, mind-altering drug in all the foods you eat. Now they're going to alter the genetics in food so that you've got pig genetics, so that you've got insect genetics, which will then begin to attenuate your genetics so that you will be more susceptible to the programming, people. And heavy punishment. They're constantly pulling you over. They're constantly taxing you. They constantly get you worried about paying bills. You're constantly punishing yourself. Could you imagine if the population at large totally says to the bill collector, Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> to every authority, Bullshit. To Monica Lewinsky and your boy, Bullshit. Are you saying but it's not the truth that you have to find, it's reality. If God is reality, then we are God. Because we are the ones who recognize reality as ourselves, and we interpret that reality as truth. God didn't write this, man did. So once you understand that man wrote this Bible, and all the interpretations that you're going to find out about, then you understand that it's only about God writing about itself, to itself. You know, sat down and write a letter, write a little letter, write a letter, write a little letter, write a letter. Remember that one? <laughs> oh, so I'm dating myself. <laughs> write a letter. Shy lights. I write a little letter. <laughs> That's what the Bible is. God writing a little letter to itself. That's what the sun is. It died to save you. In other words, it gives you the potential to redeem yourself. The sun gives up its life so that an earth may be born. And on that earth, God redeems itself from its own ignorance. You see, God redeems itself from its ignorance through man. Man is the one who becomes the realizer of God. Not God realizes man. Well, I said in Islam, there is not a There is not a Arms. Legs, legs, arms, head. The question and answer is later. Allah is arms, legs, legs, arms, head. That's all it is. So when you begin to understand that we are God, and we're going to break for a minute, when you understand that we are God, and we're going to come back to other parts of that particular reality in the Bible, when you start getting rid of the cyst that you have called religion, when you get rid of this tumor that has grown upon your psyche and the human psyche for the last 2,000 years called Jesus Christ, when you have stripped yourself and healed yourself of religion, that is when you have thrown off the yoke, thrown off the threshold that they've created for you, and a whole new beginning starts for humanity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll go to the next one. Give them a clap Give them a clap we're going to have a 15-minute break, a 15-minute break. You can go get food or whatever. Patronize the uh, vendors in the back. And we'll come back to the other part of it. We'll be back with the lecture, and then we're going to have a question and answer for uh, Peace. Thank you, brother.
uh, this is a whole, this is about 25 or 30 of these books. To do with building that institution, I do hear claim right now and state that fact. <laughs> but, um, excuse me? Oh, okay, bless you. Can I get a witness? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I just want to quickly go over some of the things that I wanted to speak about before I, uh, I, uh, I went forward. I'm going to be appearing back here again, and I don't know if it's all right for the brothers and sisters that could tell them that we're going to be coming back. You know, it's all information, it's all good, and I'll be here for anybody who wishes to deal on any of the subjects, because I'm blessed to be able to have studied in many different subjects and be able to talk about many other things. But I'm going to be dealing with what is known as geometry, or the mathematics of the beast. And I'm going to be dealing with that um, in the next lecture with Bobby Hammett. Now, Bobby Hammett and I are supposed to be there. Bobby Hammett is speaking on my birthday, the 16th of this month. And the 17th, I'm coming back. And I'll be speaking on the mathematics of the beast. And now, I don't know if this is going to appear, but Bobby and myself are going to be sitting together. And uh, that ought to be live. <laughs> yeah, the 18th. I'll be here on the 17th, brother will be here on the 16th, and together we'll be here on the 18th. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's going to be live. Just, uh, just make sure you take that day. <laughs> um, I just want to quickly run down some things here so that you can have this on tape and we can move forward on, uh, on getting some of this information out there so that, uh, where is that? Come on, where are you at? Where was you at? Oh, cool. oh, really? <laughs> part two. Somebody take my other part there. Part two. Anyway. Okay. Uh, quickly, let me run down a few things here. I'm going to go down from... I'm going to go down from um, Genesis... Uh, Genesis 2, I'm going to start at verse 16, 17, uh, to 18, 19, uh, all the way down to, and I'm going to take it all the way to the serpent, and then we can go right into the, um, the questions and answers, because I want to get that on there too. There's a lot more for me to do, because I always over-prepare. So I want to cover Genesis 2 so that the next time we come together, I'll cover Genesis 3. But Genesis 2 is as follows, and we'll start at verses 16. Now, Genesis 2, verse 16. And remember, we're not just going to do Genesis because I got some serious dirt on the New Testament. And, oh yeah, all the Jesus freaks. I'm going to be speaking. Let me just give you a little preliminary here. The name of the next one, and this is for you, brother big man. Yes, sir. High crimes of the confounding fathers of Christendom, D-U-M-B. B.C. before the confusion, A.D. after the delusion. <laughs> Some of it will be saying, as the tale of Christianity unfolds, and by the way, there are many books that you can speak on on this. Um, uh, Hilton Hodema is in the back. They got all the books back there for sale. Um, you can read uh, the book by uh, Paul Christian, The History of Magic. Um, you can read the Bhagavad Gita. You can read the uh, Sefer Yetzirah. You can read um, the uh, Mahabharata. You can read a book that's out of print, but it's very, very difficult to find. Hopefully you can find it. It's called um, uh, the Greatest Story Never Told by Lana Cantrell. Um, there's a book called The History and the Falsehoods of Christianity. And I've got to get the name of this, this the brother, because a lot of the work that I'm doing here is between all the Potomas and his works and a lot of the other works that come from me just studying, I mean, just looking into everything that they don't want me to look into. You see, you got to go off the beaten track. And in the hallway, it's so beautiful to walk amongst you, to see all of what it is that you already understand of what it is that I'm trying to say. It's just, and, and sister says something, it's time to free the people to make them feel good about thinking another way. Yeah. 
Because sometimes the people need to hear it from someone to tell them it's all right to think this way. Because the cattle and the thousand-headed ass makes you believe that this, you think this way something is wrong. That you're going against the grain. See, what you're doing is you upset, you're upsetting their certitude. This is the way they make their bread and butter. If nobody's going back to church, what's your boy Reverend Fatback going to do? He ain't got no church. Gotta get a job, a real job. So as the tale of Christianity unfolds, it will be revealed that it is the most spiritually illiterate and ignorant faith in all the annals of religious fanaticism. Christianity is, and Christians, the Christian founding fathers are so stupid, they couldn't even make a, a religion of their own. They had to borrow somebody else's. Christianity is based upon what the Hebrews gave them. That's why the Jews are so closely related and knitted with this shit. Could you imagine this is the reason why the Jews get away with all the shit they get away with now? Because we actually worship in a Jew! You think about that. You think I give a shit about him being nailed on the cross? We didn't bleed. It may be safely said that the game of life was called, just like any other football game, on account of darkness. Think about that. The game of life was called on account of darkness. And you know what that darkness was? Christianity. The dark ages. The night of Christian thought. The blackout of evolutionary consciousness. A short circuit in consciousness. Energy that gave light to the world of matter that brings the arcane wisdom to the ancient masters and the ascended masters that was nurtured in the land of Kim in the light of the world went dark. Everything went dim in the dark ages. And that's the time when the Moors were defeated in Europe. Just think about it. The fact that the Moors were defeated in Europe and that's when the dark ages started. That's when the Roman Catholic Church began to destroy the feminine principle of God it began to destroy the mathematics of creation, the truth behind what God is, not who God is. The Catholic Church, which is the mother of all Christian churches. Listen to me, people. I don't give a shit if you are another kind of Christian standing over here. I'm this born-again Christian. I'm this other Methodist, this and that. You all come under the Pope. Christian fundamentalism was funded out of the Vatican. And the monies that came to push Reverend Falwell and all the rest of them came out of Buckingham Palace. Think about that one. So Catholic religions, the Catholic, the Pope, that's why he can field 10 million people in a field in a square right now because he is the chief of all Catholics, all Christians. He is Peter. If you believe that bullshit. Now the Catholic Church claims it was founded on Christ, by Christ, and established in stone. That is, through Peter. You get it? Peter, Petra, stone. In one of its many writings, we find the following claims. St. Peter's supremacy can be proven by the Bible. Now, I, I want to give you this information here that you could get off the web and bless her heart, Sister Delise Hanley. She's always getting into the web and bringing down some information. The hidden history of Jesus and the Holy Grail. Let me tell you, I, just, I go everywhere to find it. But you see, good Christians won't want to believe anything else but what they think will keep them safe and, and, and warm at night, you know? Um, was there no historical Jesus by Earl Doherty? This dude does a scholastic breakdown of the falsehood around this person called Jesus. How it never existed until after 325 AD. Wasn't no Jesus Christ until after J. Matter of fact, it wasn't until 625 and the 6th Council of Nicaea that the man on the cross was accepted as one of the symbols of Christianity. Before that, it was a sheep with the cross on him, and before that, it was two fish. Wasn't no, it wasn't no person called Jesus. It wasn't no anthropological man walking. 
and your Constantinople. Constantinople was built by Constantine, the so-called Holy Christian Emperor, the bastard who took the information because when he went east and he went where the actual information was, where they were dealing with 72 degrees, where they were dealing with 90 degrees of knowledge, he went there to try to be indoctrinated and incorporated into those mystery systems and they said, get the fuck out of here. So he said, oh, you deny me. You deny me, baby, I'm coming back. I'm gonna start my own shit and I'm coming back. And that's what he did. And that's when he started raising and destroying everything else. He started bringing together all these priests and all of them started coming together because they were warned. There were two factions of Christianity at the time. There was one that was worshiping Jesus in the west of Rome and another one that was worshiping Christos. But it wasn't Christianity. It was two factions of sun worship. And they were warring with one another in Rome. So what did he do? Because his military was so weak and they were so, uh, they were so indolent, he had to go and get people who were the Tartars and the uh, Attila the Hun and all the Vandals and the Visigoths to come and patrol the streets. The same way they're going to do you right now. When they're going to go and get them Serbians that don't give shit about you and put them in American uniforms and walk them down the streets. All right? Same thing Constantine did. And he took all these Visigoths and all of the people they call the Vandals. That's why they call you Vandalized. That's where they got the name from. The Vandals came in there and raised Rome. So he brought them in to patrol the streets. But before he could bring them into Rome, he had to go and take the Pope or the people. What he did, he took them and went and Christianized them first. That's where the Germans got Christianity in Catholicism. You know the Pope was hooked up with Hitler. That's where that came from. So when they came in, they brought these so-called mongrels in to keep the warring factions of sun worship apart in Rome. So since it was getting hot and heavy in Rome, he says, I can't hold here in peace. I can't hold me up with He said, let's go and build a, a, a city 700 miles outside of Rome. So he built Constantinople, which today is Istanbul. Okay? So now Constantinople gets built. He brings all the bishops from the different regions together, and there's about 1,600 of them. He says, let's create a whole new religion. Let's, uh, can we all get along? <laughs> they say, hell no. So they started fighting. They had to bring soldiers in there they were warring so heavy. Just the 1,600 of them was fighting. Because they wanted to create this amalgamation. Constantine had this big idea of bringing and consolidating his power in Rome and around all over the place by bringing in all these people. So the people who said, hell no, and marched out, either killed them, drove them out, or bought them off. By the time he was finished with his campaign of fighting and all the 300 people were left. 300 bishops were left and said, okay, pay me enough, give me lands, and I'll go along with it. And Christianity was born. That's how Christianity was born. And after that, remembering that he was refused initiation into the secret systems, he took that cross, which is the symbol of death, and at the end of that cross, he pushed his bullshit religion, which became Christianity. Christianity took and stole all the riches. That is the richest church on the planet. And how come three crosses of the planet is in poverty now? You can preach all that Jesus shit to me. But every place you touched with the Bible was ravaged and raped. Blood flowed like rivers every time Christianity touched down on any land. So don't tell me no shit about Jesus coming down to save anybody. It's bullshit. You gotta get the bullshit factor up. Conspiracy of silence. The Jesus puzzle. Now the website is http colon slash www dot magi m a g i dot com slash wiggle oblio o b l i o slash jesus with a small j slash patom p a r t o m e dot h t m now you get in there and you download some of the scholastic histories 
showing you how the people who were writing, that's supposed to have been the writers of Christianity, weren't writing about Jesus at all. They were writing about truth and the ancient pagan. What they were doing, they were actually uh, interpreting the ancient pagan tongues and the ancient pagan realities, the ancient pagan um, um, uh, uh, historicity of what deity meant. And they began forging that information. And it wasn't until Marcion and all the rest of these people who wanted to forward this so-called Christ myth, this Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos. And the, the whole life, that whole life that they started was actually a cosmological life of how the sun passed through the 12 signs of the zodiac during the, uh, um, the optominal, the equinoxes, the, the procession of the equinoxes. That's all that's about. Now you got that, let me move forward. One of the many writings finds that there are three texts in the Bible for which Anglicans seem unable to assign satisfactory place in their system. Matthew 16, verse 13 and 20. Luke 22, verse 31 and 22. John 21, 15 and 17. There is no enlightenment for those who cannot see beyond the literal word. Let me say that again. There is no enlightenment for those who are, an, who are actually trapped and cemented within the literal word. And that's exactly what they want you to do with this Bible. Read the literal word so that they will interpret it for you. But every new Bible that has come out since 1611, and remember 1612 is when they started the official slave trade. Clue! The first ship was the good ship Jesus. Clue! You niggas out there in them churches, I don't believe that y'all still worshiping Jesus Christ after that piece of history came. I don't understand that shit. You say you're going to worship in Jews, and you know what the biggest bullshit was? And I couldn't believe it. Sister, my lady said this. Check this out. Watching Amistad. Now all you niggas went rushing for this dumbass female called Debbie Allen. I did not go. All right, good. What blew my mind is that you allowed this Steven Spielberg to get away from the bullshit factor with your Harpo Winfrey. <laughs> that fucking clown, Oprah. Harpo Winfrey. That jigaboo nigga. That kiss ass. Destroy my marriage. I hope she invites me on one day. I know, I won't hold my breath. But if you should have seen the way she did the Monica Lewinsky on this motherfucker in broad, what do you call it? Well, that's going to be the new way to say, you know. Do you, and you know, check this out. Do you know that the Gap's clothing went up now since they found out Miss Thing had Gap clothing that got stained with semen? They're making big money? Do you know the breath mint that she used after she did the do? Altoids has now got a soaring sales. Cigars went up. Only in America. Only in America, right? I was listening to a radio station coming up from Philly, and they said, what are the Ten Commandments of, um, of, uh, of uh, what's his name, Bill Clinton? What's the Ten Commandments if he wrote it? And one of the funniest things I heard was, they were saying, uh, you know, thou shalt not kneel before me, or something like that. <laughs> then, they said, then one of them said, thou shalt not use thy rod on thy staff. <laughs> I said, yeah, <laughs> this is going to be like that. <laughs> You're going to see this kind of stuff. But you see, now the feminists ain't got nothing to say. You know? Because, you know, I mean, what are they going to say about it? You know? Sure. Anyway, when you're looking at the situation and you're dealing with the... Uh, and you're dealing with the Bible now and just to get you off of that particular uh, thing, I don't remember what I'm on, I was on before, but I'm back to this now. Uh... In John 21, verse 15 through 17. Now, if you understood who John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was, you know, we're going to get into that too. 
But you got to remember that Luke was Lucian. And John is not a person. John is, is actually a symbol of the ion, I-O-N, because there was no J. The ionic field of the atom. Matthew was Marcion. Marcion was one of the people who plagiarized the writings of a man called Apollonius of Tiana when that man went to the east and studied under a guru and brought back the principles of the chakra and how to be initiated in Kundalini. And that's what Revelation was. It was written by Apollonius after he took the information of initiation through the raising of the seven chakras, which is the opening of the seven seals. The lamb that was there for slaughter was actually the lamb or the neophyte ready for initiation. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm going to speak about what the real seal is in, uh, in uh, the mathematics of the beast. And you deal with the seal and you see what the seal is about. The true seal is the word. And you shall have that word emblazoned on your forehead or in your forehead. And we're going to speak about how the word is the seal and the seal is the word and how they already marked you with the seal of the beast by the fact that you speak English. <laughs> y'all think y'all not marked. Y'all waiting for something to put in your arms and shit. That's bullshit. Y'all already been marked. John 21, 15 through 17. So when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas. Now, now here, check this. Simon, son of Jonas. Where you heard that name before? Jonah and the whale. Ooh. Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Hath thee unseen? Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again a second time, Simon. Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Feed my sheep. Wait a minute. What's the difference between lamb and sheep? Feed my lamb. The lamp of God that taketh away the sins of the world. See, the lamb and the lamp. <laughs> Y'all ain't ready. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he saith unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, as you know metaphysically, Peter is the earth, and it is the earth that must feed the lambs. Feed all things. That is, life that is upon it. As the statement is repeated three times, it signifies the three biological kingdoms. It signifies those three, and the text has nothing whatsoever to do with the Catholic Church, except to debunk it. Now, as Jonah is a mythical man, calling Peter his son must make Peter mythical as well. Now, here I got something to tell you. Check it. <laughs> Wait. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 20. Hang on real quick. Matthew 13. Now you ever watch those evangelists, those televangelists, they got you turning to it and telling you one, you know? Can you imagine they giving me a televangelist some time on TV? Baby, I'll give them Bible all right. 13, 13 through 20. Back to 16, 13 through 20. Now I'm going to show you something. This is going to be deep. Here's where you're going to find another version of Satan. We're going to get to him again. 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am, that, that I, the Son of God, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and the others Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed thou art, Simon, Bar Joel, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, 
my, my Father which is in heaven. And he said unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and thou shalt bind on earth. And this is what the Pope is using. Because he's Peter, remember? Alright? So if the Catholic Church is founded on Peter, it is founded... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got a good one for you. I forgot to give you this one. I got to take you to Luke before I take you to this one. <laughs> Luke 22. Turn your Bibles real quick. Luke 22. All right? I know you got it. Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. Verse 32, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and that thou covet and strengthen my brethren. Am I on the right one? 22 verse. No. Here I am. And the Lord said to Simon, Behold. Now check this out. You ready? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold. Satan has desired to have thee, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou converted strength and brethren. And he said unto the Lord, Lord, I am here for thee, both going to prison and to death. And he said to Peter, I'm the cock -o. but get this, this was changed. This was changed, because it doesn't say that in the Bible. Because in here, he says that Peter is associated with Satan. Because in this one, it says here, Behold, Satan hath desired to have thee. He turned to Peter and said to Peter, Satan, I desire to have thee. See, that's in the older Bibles. Now, it says here that this text definitely has something to do with the Catholic Church. That is that Jesus in the passage is associates Peter with Satan. Those who understand the occults know what it means. So when we go back to Matthew verse 16, from 13 to 20, we understand when Jesus came into the coast of Philippi, who to say I am. So if the Catholic Church is founded on Peter, it means it was founded on Satan. Satan actually means matter. Peter is the rock, the third rock from the sun. Check it out. Peter is actually Esau of the Old Testament, who founded metaphysically a city called Petra. Also Edom which really means atom, A-T-O-M, the earth. It is the atomic structure of matter that binds and looses according to its laws. These are St. Peter's keys. They are atoms, quarks, neutrons. That's the keys of the church that Peter was given. See, Peter being the earth, given those keys, he was given the creative essence, all of the components necessary to bring that rock to life. Peter was also Pharaoh. He also bound and loosed the life force, which was supposed to be the Israelites. His battle with Moses depicts this. Paul's quarrel with Peter is also the same thing cosmologically. Apart from its cosmological meaning, the story of Peter's supremacy is asinine. One mortal man, an ignorant Jewish fisherman, endowed with absolute spiritual power over all humanity for all eternity. Isn't that supposed to be God's job? Catholics are totally numb and dumb in their unquestioning faith. How could they possibly believe that in Hotep, Confucius, Buddha, and Socrates required this idiot to bind and loose their souls? Peter never existed. So how does Catholicism claim that he established a papacy of Rome? Because like the myth of Romulus, being the founder of Rome, Peter, like Romulus, is nothing but an epitome, an eponym. An eponym is a person whose name is or is thought to be the source of the name of something which as a city or a country or even an era like Washington DC, Lincoln Monument, that's all Peter is. Even with this fact, the Catholic Encyclopedia has the nerve to print in brazen authority that his founding of the Roman bishop, bishopric is among the best ascertained facts of history and no scholar dares to contradict it, oh yeah? This only goes to show us the cancer in Catholic scholarship. With its capacity for blatant, blatant intellectual dishonesty, anything can be proven. All they have to do is say it. And if there's no scholar to contend with their claim, it's because no scholar can get hold of the proof 
that was either destroyed or is now held hostage by the Vatican. Catholic apologists pretend to examine all the facts clearly containing and concerning Peter, but then presents us with documents that originated in the Dark Ages. Wait a minute, people, check this. They give you documented proof of Christ's existence from documents that they pulled up that was made in the Dark Ages. What does that tell you? <laughs> See, that's going to be the cry. Oh, okay. All right. I wanted to get past this. All right, I'm going to go through it. Now, you all can take this information, and when you got your Bible at home, I'm going to read the verses off very quickly, put down what the meanings are to these verses, so that you could match them to them, instead of just going and explaining them. Verse 16 and 17. Knowledge of good and evil. This is um, chapter, chapter 2. Verse 16 and 17 of Genesis. Knowledge of good and evil comes from an epigenetic or the evolutionary experience of reality. That is matter in all its forms. This tree of knowledge is therefore life experience with matter. To taste of it meant spiritual death. That's all it means. To taste of the fruit of tree of knowledge meant spiritual death for you to get the ability or have the ability to have knowledge. Knowledge comes from spiritual death. Because with some, something that is all chaos, all knowing, all everything, you cannot know yourself. Remember, ignorance is a necessary component to the evolution of knowledge. Okay? To taste of this uh, meant spiritual death in the involutionary sense. This being the great crime of mythology perverted by the priests. There is, however, a contradiction in terms, an absurd one at that, because tasting of the fruit of the tree was the whole process and purpose of creation in the first place. So to say that you committed a sin, or that Eve committed a sin, or that Adam sinned and is somehow liable because they ate of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of, 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 of good and evil, and was cursed by it, that's ridiculous, because that was the point in the first place. Therefore, this commandment is a commandment against the Creator's own will. That's a contradiction in terms. Verse 18. The current translation of Christianity around this particular verse is a rank insult to women because it gives the perception that she was but an afterthought in the whole creative process. Nothing more than a spare rib for the big kahuna. The male. This is what the priesthood of all forms of Christianity make you believe by condemning you to the literal word, the dead letter word. Sisters, you must understand what the occult translation means. But before you even explore this path, we must put this verse in its proper sequence. This verse should rightfully follow verse 20. You see? Verse 18 is supposed to be behind verse 20. So verse 19 and 20. In verse 19, Adam is introduced abruptly and unceremoniously. He just drops out of nowhere. The ancients would never have introduced him this way. In verse 20, as a human being, Adam namely, naming the countless creatures, including the fishes, the insects, and even germs and bacteria, is silly and childless. Symbolically, it means the expression of the ultimate potential as the life principle made them. Adam is the genetic consciousness. This is what, um, God, I wish I had his brother's name. I'll get you the name of the, uh, the, the book where you can actually be uh, reading into this because I had to find this book buried in the dust at Barnes and Nobles. They would not let this book out. Adam is the genetic consciousness. In Hebrew it means red clay and therefore it means the earth. Here Adam and the atom are one. Adam is the atom. But the name Adam is not Hebrew in origin. Adam, Adam is found originally in the Chaldean scriptures. <laughs> much older than these Hebrews. It was a name also known to the Babylonians. Among the Babylonians, their clay tablets, found by this guy named George Smith, show an occult account, or an account etched in stone of creation, identical with that of the Bible. In this story, the first man was named Adama, and the first woman was named Heva. 